It was a year like no other. Never have I had to change a summer canoe trip due to a virus, but indeed we did, multiple times, based on changing restrictions. But finally it was decided, the White River. If you drive through Northern Ontario along the Trans-Canada Highway, you will cross the White River several times. This river was heralded as one of the top 10 rivers to paddle in Ontario. The keyword was. So what has changed and what remains the same? My friend Ben and I were about to find out with the opening of the river after over a decade of being shut down. A journey full of challenges, setbacks, surprises, and misadventures as we begin from the bay and unknown headwaters of Naguazu Lake, 192 kilometers down to the mouth at Lake Superior. began with a two-day drive to Pakasa National Park, a drive Ben and I are quite familiar with. Despite logging well over a thousand kilometers to get there, we never tire of the drive, especially around Lake Superior as the views and vistas are simply amazing. After overnighting in Sault Ste. Marie, we headed to Pakasa to drop off our vehicle and meet our shuttle driver from Naturally Superior. While registering at the park gate, this is where we ran into our first unexpected problem. We ran into a little bit of problem here at the park office. Um, we didn't realize that they need us to contact them prior to get the stuff all ready. They were saying that we need to do an orientation. Uh, there's some questionnaire procedures in place that could take more than an hour. Uh, so it's kind of a little bit of a setback, but um, anyhow, hopefully we'll get it all sorted out and we'll get on our way. Unexpectedly, one of the park staff recognized me as the passionate paddler and thankfully let us off, realizing we were experienced trippers. With that sorted out, we quickly transferred the gear and canoe and headed off with Jacob, our shuttle driver, towards Naguazu Lake. But this is where we encountered our next problem. Do well, we have a pylon or something? Uh, or... Okay. Got my Ooh, on for the we most just part. lost the wheel. <laughs> Wow. So uh, there was been some wobbling in the vehicle. We weren't sure what it was. And uh, we just, what, not even like 15, 20 minutes from Pakasa and the wheel busted off. And thankfully we're okay. Um, there's no vehicle behind us, but we lost the wheel. Those guys are trying to get the wheel. Not that it makes any difference, but we're gonna have to, uh, something's gonna have to change on this trip now. We're gonna have to figure out how to how we're going to get to the access point and how Jacob's going to get back. Not only did we lose a wheel, we didn't even have cell reception to get help. So after many attempts to sort out our dilemma, it was ultimately a kind Samaritan that offered to help that got us back on our way. Stuck out in nowhere, a tow truck was not immediately available, nor was anyone from Naturally Superior. So a Samaritan took Ben back to his truck which we then used as the shuttle vehicle. So we got the vehicle, we just loaded up the canoe and all our gear. So we're, they can't tow it right now, so we're gonna actually go to, is it in um, White, River. White River? Husking. Husking, okay, so we're gonna go there. They have a tow truck there, but they can't come and get it now. So we're gonna drop off the keys and they're gonna pick it up later. And then uh, Jacob is gonna drop us off at uh, the access point and he's gonna go back to NSA with, the, with Ben's vehicle. And then they're gonna make arrangements to drop it off at the park uh, so that we can have it for. But the keys, right? Well, still gotta sort a few things out. Who's gonna? They're gonna. Have to... You think that would finally be the end of it? But there was just one more problem. I so know. Ben's come back oh, from Pakasa. Still stinks, eh? Oh, dude. Come on, it's not better. We're gonna open the windows. Someone had dumped a litter of cat shit onto the highway and I stepped into a big pile of it while dealing with the vehicle issue. Despite trying to clean as much as I could prior to getting into the vehicle, it was still bad. Bad enough, they pulled over by a lake so that I could get my boot cleaned further. 
With order restored in the universe, we continued on our way. Our next obstacle was the sketchy road to Niguazu Lake. With no information as to the condition other than satellite maps, we headed down a logging road, which initially was in great shape. It was only the last stretch where things got pretty rough, but we eventually made it. We made it to Naguazu Lake, after everything we had to deal with, so we were just thankful it all worked out. Being late in the day, our goal was to simply find a campsite close by, so after saying our farewells to Jacob, it was finally time to start the trip. We set off immediately as a storm loomed overhead, and it wasn't long before we pulled up to a small island to make camp. It was obviously well used with all sorts of paraphernalia and junk left by other campers, but due to the continuing storms, we decided to stay and make the most of it. It started raining again, so it's good that we have this tarp set up, but uh, now that we can't really do anything, Ben has a surprise for us. What did you bring? Wooching! Beer! A single beverage <laughs> for us to enjoy. And then I have to carry this can for 180 kilometers back to town. Oh. Uh, well, we are thirsty, so we're going to drink and celebrate our first night. It is probably, what, 8 o'clock now? Quarter after 8. Yeah. And hopefully the rain will pass and then we can get our tent set up. I don't think there's going to be much more that we're going to do tonight. We were thinking about fishing because of all the good fishing that's uh, supposed to be on this lake and uh, see if we can catch ourselves a walleye. We'll see once, the rain, <laughs> if and when the rain passes. Yeah, if, if it passes. It doesn't look like it's gonna pass. Uh, no. All right, time to indulge in some beer. We didn't end up fishing as the storms kept rolling through and the winds picked up. So we decided to turn in. If anything, we were just hoping for better conditions tomorrow as we would have to cross the lake in order to get to the White River. Even though it was still gray and overcast, we were most relieved that the wind had died. So after a quick and easy breakfast, we set off from our island refuge and made our way across Niguazu Lake, looking for the start of the White River. At the far western end, we could hear and discern the obscure outlet where Niguazu Lake gives birth to the White River. Even though it was shallow and overgrown, we decided to just push through the narrow channel. Are you good? Yep. Just trying to make it go slow. Yeah, it's been tough. Just going to bunch of cedars, little cedars. And just like that, we were officially on the White River. On the uppermost reaches, we paddled through small lake-like sections, which of course presented no problems. But the narrows between them wasn't as easy, especially this section where a pile of driftwood and dead trees created quite an obstacle course. Every inch of forward progress through this part required a healthy dose of elbow grease. In retrospect, this was just a small glimpse of some of the challenges that lay ahead. No doubt progress was slow and tough. Besides the narrows, there was a lot of shallow water and rocks. This necessitated many unconventional and conventional ways to get through, such as pulling the canoe with our hands, dragging it, and of course portaging. One thing was clearly evident. No one had passed through this area in a very long time. Not surprising. However, we did find some evidence, like a cut piece of wood that had lichen growing on it, and an old rusted tackle box found in the riverbed. Most people prefer to avoid sections such as these, and I can totally understand why. But I find something uniquely rewarding 
connecting Kanua River from its source to its mouth. To me, this provides a complete experience that embodies every characteristic, peculiar or distinguishing that is representative of a river. It's like a friend you've known their entire life that makes your relationship inherently more intimate. Our goal that day was to try and make it to Sakina Lake, which is only 15 kilometers away. Because there was no information on this stretch and the challenges we knew we would face, we hoped our conservative goal was attainable. There were times, however, when we questioned if we'd make it, but things improved late in the day and we found ourselves paddling more than crawling along. We finally paddled under Highway 17 and pushed into Sagina Lake just after 5 o'clock, but our struggles were hardly over. With no place to make camp, we had no choice but to continue down the river. But thankfully after another two hours, we found an old campsite and ended our day there. Just when we thought everything was all good, we had the misfortune of some dubious friends hitching a ride after a refreshing swim. My one paled in comparison to Ben's 40 plus leeches of all different sizes that latch onto his foot. Needless to say, he won this competition. Despite the long day, we felt good about our progress, and after a hearty meal to refuel our calorie deprived bodies, we hit the hay soon after. After a solid night's sleep, we awoke to a gorgeous morning. The type of morning where you'd love to watch the mist burn off with a hot cup of coffee. But adventure was calling, and after enjoying some hearty breakfast wraps, we were soon on our way. Good morning, we are back on the White River. It is just after nine o'clock and we are off. Today, um, I don't think there's gonna be too much excitement. There'll be some rapids, but there'll be a lot of paddling. And I think our goal is to get around the town of White River. And we've got a special little um, appointment date. date. <laughs> date. <laughs> so we'll, we'll let you know when we get there. It wasn't long after before we got to see our first moose of the trip. This combined with various small log jams and even a small swift, which kept our paddles and eyes busy. We eventually entered a lowland where we paddled through a large marsh. It was also here we saw our second moose and also lucked out by catching a walleye nice. and perch which we decided to keep for lunch. When our stomachs began to grumble, we were incredibly lucky to come across this island oasis in this vast marsh. We then set about cleaning the fish, getting a fire going, and then making some delicious fish tacos to eat. Tasty. Tasty? Mm-hmm. Fresh veggies and fresh fish. Nice. It was a nice break in such a remote and beautiful place, but it was time to get back on the water and put distance behind us. We eventually left the marsh and soon came to our first marked rapid, called Sandy Portage Rapids. As much as we enjoyed the flat water paddle, we were looking forward to some more excitement that comes with moving water. To the right, to follow the V down. There we go. There we go. Rapids on the uppermost section of a river are often small and rocky yeah. because the head lake is yeah. often the only source of water that feeds the river. But as it makes its way to the mouth, Many tributaries and other smaller rivers feed into it and accumulatively increases the volume at its lower reaches. But for now, we'd have to contend with a lot more chaotic maneuvering, scraping, and luck to get through. Yeah, let's run it down. Let's run it down. 
Yep. There we go. Go left. Go right. Ah, oh, there's not much. Let's go down this way. So left. Yep. We made it. Not bad. Not bad. Let's turn around just to look at it. I guess it looks like you could have went center, eh? Yeah. As we continued our way towards the town of White River, there appeared to be more and more rapids, some marked and others not. We scouted larger ones and others we continued to run blind. It was fun. They weren't always pretty runs as rocks were everywhere and oftentimes we did get out when we couldn't discern a line. But there were some that got our hearts pumping and adrenaline flowing as we smashed through white water in waves. You couldn't have seen a bigger smile on our faces after some of the runs. Yep. Yep. Sorry. Right. Straight. We were amazed at all the rapids we continued to come upon, one after another, late into the day. We were beginning to wonder if we'd make it to town to execute our novel plan, but we eventually made it just in time. This historical town has its roots as a trading post and eventually as a locomotive town, which it still is to this day. But we were here for burgers at the A&W, which we thoroughly enjoyed. Sure, the town of White River is nothing like it was when it traded in furs, but in the same spirit, we stopped by, traded for food, and continued on as modern voyageurs. We would have preferred to continue on and try and find camp further along the river, but we had a problem. The sun was about to set and more rapids were to follow, which would make finding camp not only very difficult, but dangerous. It was then we went from being modern day voyageurs to squatters and decided to take advantage of the flat real estate by the edge of the tracks. There was definitely the possibility of being kicked out and the inconvenience of trains passing through, but we decided to risk it. It quickly became the most ridiculous and unusual place I've camped at while on a canoe trip. It was not on my bucket list, but certainly noteworthy. So, we didn't get kicked out, and we survived the night, even with the two trains that passed by and shook the ground we slept on. It was definitely novel, if not unique, but it was time to get packed up and get moving as we decided to have breakfast at some point further down the river. It wasn't the nicest morning to paddle, with the low grey clouds and rain, but the river was calm and there was mist, which made up for it. But better yet, it was the rapids that followed that made things that morning pretty interesting. Go to the right. Yep. Okay, here we go. So from the left to the right, you said, or? Uh, we gotta go center. Yeah. Then to the left, and then fall on the wave train. Okay. Of course, you gotta watch for the big boulder on the left, right? Yeah. Yep. But I don't think it's gonna be a problem.
Yep. Good gear. This one, right? Yep. Okay. And there is one rock to worry about straight ahead, so we'll yeah. go to the right of that. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, part two of Tarpon. Um, there's a calm section in between. And so we're gonna scout this one. It's a little bit of a drop. I just wanna make sure we can see the, the line that we can uh, paddle it down. The crux of this run was the last drop. Not only did we have to thread the canoe between two rocks, but the side channel and current had the potential to swing the back end of the canoe to the side, potentially pinning it. Combined with the fact that the water before the drop was highly aerated, we were dealing with some difficult conditions. But, we still decided to attempt it. This is gonna be a big run, our biggest yet. Yep, just to the right of that rock. Yep. Did not go as planned. Almost. At the last drop, we knew it was going to be a tough one, but uh, the back end had just pulled out and we came down at an angle and, uh, and then it, it um, resulted in us tipping over. So we just emptied the canoe and uh, we're just uh, a little bit draggled. <laughs> uh, a little bit of injury, scraped my hand, but not a big deal. And there's a moose is still down there waiting for us so we're gonna paddle down to the next rapid devil's rapid there's a campsite there we're gonna probably stop and uh, get something to eat and uh, get our coffee wits back together <laughs> and continue down the river the river indeed taught us a lesson but also gave us our third moose or was the moose in calm water the lesson either way we moved on richer for the experience for I have always believed Bad things with introspection are often good lessons in life. Once we got to the next rapid, we pulled out at the portage and checked the campsite. It was rough and as expected hadn't been used in years, but it would do. We needed to refuel our empty tanks with breakfast, but also needed a fire to warm up and dry out as we were chilled at this point. Okay, we're running double rapid. Now that we felt much better, it was time to get back on the water. Oftentimes, after a dump, paddlers are often shaken up and adverse to running more white water, which is a normal reaction. But with a day full of rapids, we simply put the incident behind us and immediately got back in the canoe. 
With the name Devil's Rapids, you would think this would keep us on the portage, but instead we decided to take the devil by the horns. The rapids came one after another. Some we scouted on the run, and others we got out to scout. But either way, we tackled them all, regaining our confidence and mojo with each and every one. Okay, you feel good? Yeah. About this one? Yeah. Me too. I'll just keep the speed. The water levels were definitely not high, nor were they too low. Just enough to keep the canoe afloat so that we could get through. Yep. But one thing was a constant. Rocks. Everywhere. We had to weave the canoe like a snake and remain sharp and reactive for each and every run. some twisty turning. White water is definitely not for everyone. It is a high stress activity with consequences. But whether it is to avoid portages, the fun of running rapids, or the rush of adrenaline, there is no doubt executing rapids skillfully is not only highly addictive, but very rewarding. It was an incredible day of whitewater fun, even with our dump earlier on. We almost pulled off running every single rapid that day, except when we came upon this one. Yeah, a falls. Yeah, it's a falls, yeah. So we come upon the next rapid, and we were thinking it's going to be smaller than Hawks, but it's significantly bigger. But mind you, what, a, what if you had come down that way, on the left side? It looks very strange. It's a, pretty much a falls and they marked this as a rapid. Ooh. Wow. Look at that rock, eh? Yeah. Beautiful. So we're going to walk the portage. The weird thing is the portage starts way back and it's only supposed to be 230 meters and that does not make sense. Uh, you would have, by the time you did the 230 meters, you would have ended up at the falls here. But wow, it's gorgeous. Really, really pretty. As we could run the set below, we simply dragged the canoe down the drop and bypassed the overgrown portage. Holy, it's slippery. Yeah, it's really good. We couldn't have asked for more that day, as it was jam-packed with rapids right to the end. The White River was truly living up to the notion of a river full of white water. But after 12 hours of this, we were more than happy to pull up to a rough campsite to end the day. Yeah. At least we knew we'd sleep soundly that night, without the rumble of trains passing through. We awoke to another overcast morning, but this time well rested. We started the day in the bug shelter since our campsite perched high up on the edge of a drop came with perks, mosquitoes, and lots of them. It didn't take long to convince us to get out of there as soon as possible. Okay, so we are finally back on the water after getting off that hell hole, which we really liked last night, but this morning we were just getting annihilated. And uh, it's good to be back on the water, eh? Oh yeah. Uh, and I think uh, despite the gray day, it should be really nice in terms of uh, it'll keep us cool and uh, hopefully we can uh, get a good run today. Today, the majority of our paddle would be through a lowland as the flow of the river slowed and we found ourselves weaving through marshes and small lakes. It wasn't anything like the previous day, but we still got to paddle through a handful of rapids, rapids that were wide and shallow. Right here. Yep. Woo. 
straight. Keep going. The low grey clouds weren't just window dressing either, as it rained down on us several times throughout the day, which is never enjoyable, but there were highlights too. One, seeing a train pass by as we paddled alongside the tracks, and the second being a long and significant rapid that ended at White Lake. Thankfully, we were able to run all of it, as the alternative was a 1.6 km portage that was in rough shape. We were having problems finding a place to pull over for lunch due to the unsuitable shoreline prior to White Lake, but the docks at the public boat launch provided an ideal location. Thankfully, we finished our wraps just in time before another wave of rain hit us. White Lake is a big body of water and also an intersectional destination as the train tracks in Highway 17 not only crosses this lake, but you also find the First Nations town of Mobert, as well as White Lake Provincial Park. As we were at the southernmost end of the lake, our crossing was short, but we did have to contend with a short lift over across a narrow stretch of land. We seriously considered staying at a campsite at White Lake Provincial Park. But the hustle and bustle of summer campers and the trouble of getting a camp permit made the decision for us. Thus, we continued paddling down the lake, looking for something more isolated and wilderness-like. In the end, our decision to move on paid off as we found an amazing beach campsite with ample flat areas to pitch our tent and shelter. We couldn't have asked for more as it ended up being one of our favorite campsites on the trip. The day started out overcast and gloomy, and we thought we'd be in for another wet one. But surprisingly it cleared and turned out to be a beautiful day, but there would be a different kind of cloud cover. Today would mark a turning point on our trip. From the headwaters to this point, the information on the route ranged from obscurity to being unknown. But from White Lake to Lake Superior, the route is not only well documented and mapped, it has been paddled by many canoeists previously. Yet for us, in the following days, it would be anything but predictable. Many years ago, when I looked into paddling this river, I was told by a park official that it was not recommended. The staff member mentioned work on a dam at Ambato Falls being the primary reason. Then in a couple years, when I inquired again, I found out it was now closed. The park staff was vague on the subject matter, and I just assumed more work was being done at Ambato Falls. Fast forward almost a decade later, Ben and I would be the first to paddle the White River after its opening and we would soon find out why, as it was nothing like how we expected. So we are approaching the White Lake Dam and there are signs on either side to warn people. I guess there is some fast water. We know there is below it, but uh, you know. We'll find out soon enough. Okay, so just want to give you an update. Based on the map, we uh, we saw that sign warning us about a dam, and it's going to be coming further on. But based on the map, nothing makes sense. And we what we think is that they destroyed the old dam because we saw some big rock and and the road that led down to it, and it's all gone now, or it's kind of blocked off. And we think that uh, based on the topography and the way the river curves, it, the, the original dam doesn't exist and it's probably further down the river. Even even just uh, paddling in this area, there's a lot of stumps that we can see in the water and you can see the shoreline has a lot of cut trees on it. So, um, well, I mean, this map was made in, was it 2002? 2002. So that's like 18 years ago and things have definitely changed since then. So this is interesting to note. So you think these have been cut since that map was written? Yeah. Because they probably raised this level. Yep. Yep. I think that makes a lot of sense. There's a bunch of rapids that we should be running at this point that was right after the dam. And of course, it's all underneath us. It's 
it's flooded. So the first set of rapids don't even exist. So we're gonna wait till the next one, which is Kapok, Kapok Rapids. Well, we have to wait to see where the dam is. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It might be even further down. That might even be eliminated. So we'll see, we'll see. In our conversation, you can clearly hear we were confused. We were going based on very old information and assumptions, and it was now evidently very different. It would only be time before all of our questions would be answered. So yeah, you're probably right. That's probably why mm -hmm. they didn't want people going through here. There's so much work being done, not just on Bada Falls, yeah. everywhere else. But I wonder if anyone knew this. Mm -hmm. Because everyone, from what I heard, only knew thought it was the Mbada Falls. And the, the question is, why did it last so long? So we're just paddling through a narrows. This would be the Abitibi Rapids, but as you can see, there are no rapids. It's just flat water paddling. But beyond Ben, we finally are coming upon the dam. So there's buoys there to block off people from getting through. So we're gonna have to figure where to get through to uh, portage around this dam. What or what remains of the river below it? We have no idea based on how much water is being let out and uh, what kind of rapids will still exist or new ones be created. I'm not sure. Now, so we'll figure this one out and uh, see how the rest of the trip goes. It's certainly not anything like we expected, that's for sure. So here's the dam. You see it's all pretty new. We're gonna head over to the right side. There's a bunch of signs. There might be some indication as to how to get around this dam. So there's a portage sign right over there. And there's actual big sign that says portage route. The carrying of a boat or its cargo between two navigable, navigable that, water. That would be where the actual takeout would be. Yeah, yeah. It's just flow with So here we are at the dam. We're just going to quickly check it out, find out where the portage route is. There's no access. No? Oh, there's a porch on sign over there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't go that way. Okay. Lots of rats. So, starting this uh, first portage around this hydro dam. As you can see, they put some nice uh, signs. I'm not sure if this is from the hydro company or it's from the rangers that, that cleared the trails just before we began our trip. But uh, looks pretty clear. It looks like the conditions are pretty good. So. Let's see how long this goes. We have no idea well, how long this portage is because this is all new. The portage wasn't long and it looked like it was a combination of the old and the new one as the previous one skirted around Fearless Rapids or what was left of it. Our concern now was what the river was like below the dam. Okay, we've paddled a little bit down the river and we just passed Shotgun Creek and there's supposed to be swift like right here. <laughs> As you can see there is nothing. And further down there's supposed to be a rapid, a uh, shotgun rapid. And as you can clearly see, it's pretty much smooth. I don't know. Our prospects are not looking really good on this river so far. And according to Ben, I didn't know this, but he said that there was multiple dams on this river. And if that's the case, this river might go from an interesting trip to a pretty unsatisfactory and disappointing trip. The one thing you can kind of see on the riverbank is that uh, a lot of these trees, cedars, have been cut. Um, I don't know whether it was in anticipation of, well, most likely because of the dams and probably because when it was flooding they didn't want the trees to fall into into the river and most likely clog uh cause log jams down on dams further down when ben said to put in the spot x report yesterday that today well things will get interesting i think uh it was pretty dead on uh, correct there you just didn't expect it to be because there was no rapids we certainly was Certainly expecting to be running a lot of rapids today and having a lot of fun, but uh, it's not exactly turning out that way. It quickly became clear that there was another dam somewhere up ahead. Rapids and Swift that were marked on the map were gone. The shoreline damage and the continual display of stumps were indicative, but the biggest surprise was finding Chickagons Falls completely silenced. 
Chikagon's Falls was a significant cataract through a narrow gorge that even killed a paddler that accidentally got swept into it. But all that remained was an imperceptible current where once white water raged and tumbled to the river below. As we came around the bend at what was once the outflow of Chikagon's Falls, we were unexpectedly met with what looked like a large lake. This of course was still the White River, but in a different form, created by the second dam which we could clearly see in the distance. This dam was much bigger than the first one, a sprawling complex of roads, buildings, and piles of rocks. It was sad to see, but at the same time fascinating, thinking about the incredible amount of energy and work needed to create this infrastructure to re-divert the river and create a source of energy that we all use in our daily lives. But at what cost? And why, from a river that has park status? We were both bewildered and confused. However, unbeknownst to us, we'd soon get the answers to our questions. During our time at the dam, another problem currently occupied our minds. We went beside the sign, but there is no portage. We think now that because the size of the sign is probably indicating that the portage is probably somewhere over there. So we're going to get back in the canoe and look for this uh, portage. Okay, we're not having very much luck. We paddled down the length of that section of the river, which is like a lake and we did not find any portage signs and uh, so we decided to come back and walk up and over this dam to see if there's a, another way to get down. After some time looking over the area we decided to cross over on the far right side of the dam which would put us back onto the river the quickest. It unfortunately meant crossing the buoy, paddling along the shore and dragging the canoe up the man-made berm but we determined it was safe and inconsequential. Then we simply portaged our gear down the rough road to the bottom where the original course of the river continued. So being that it was so late tonight, um, it was almost seven o'clock by the time we had portaged to the water, we realized we were running out of time in order to find a campsite. And considering what we've been seeing or not seeing in terms of campsites, because it got all flooded, um, we decided to make the decision to camp at our next craziest site on this trip. So we decided to camp below the retaining wall that's holding the wall water back. You can see the tent with Ben cooking supper there. So yeah, <laughs> if the train tracks wasn't crazy enough, this will probably top that as being some of the most insane places that we've uh, camped at on a canoe trip. Not just once, once on a canoe trip, but twice. I mean, look at the look at the scenery. It's just absolutely just bizarre, but at the same time, it's kind of mesmerizing, just because this mass of rock. Despite feeling like we were camping on Mars, we made the best of the circumstances we found ourselves in. We enjoyed another walleye for supper, and then spent the rest of the evening touring around the dam. As unusual as it was to stay here, it was an unforgettable, poignant experience that reminded us that there is always a cost for the things we enjoy in life. And because we are usually far from this abrupt juxtaposition of humans versus nature, we often forget the impact and lasting effect it makes. Our night at the dam was much more restful than our camp by the train tracks. It was still weird crawling out of the tent and witnessing the unnatural scene around us, but as odd as it was, we actually didn't mind as it was so different. But as we were packing up to leave, we noticed a vehicle pull up and two men inspecting the dam. They in turn spotted our tent and canoe, so we went up to speak to them. We found out Wayne and Norman were Pick Mobert First Nation were kind enough to provide us some background information regarding the dam. As a White River courses through their traditional lands and wanting to be self-determining, they went into a long-term ownership agreement with regional power to build and maintain this dam, which would directly support their community. 
We appreciated this information as it gave us insight and context as to why the dam was built. As canoeists and wilderness advocates, we may not always agree and appreciate when our natural landscapes are altered forever, but our opinions are irrelevant in respect of those whose lands we got to paddle through and their right to self-determine. We were grateful for this opportunity and left with a better understanding. It was time to move on and we were relieved to know that there wasn't any more disruptions to the river. However, our concern now was what the water levels would be like due to this dam. No doubt we would soon find out, but first, Angle Falls. Okay, so we pulled out at uh, the falls. Obviously we can't run this. There's a nice drop off over there. Ben just walked over there to check out the falls. I'm gonna join him now. There was an 800 meter portage on river left, but because of the lack of water, we simply carried over a significantly shorter distance over the exposed rocks on river right, and we were soon back on the river to tackle the remaining rapids below the falls. Before we left, Ben decided to drop his line below the falls, and it wasn't long before he hooked on to a fish. We finally hooked on to the first pike of the trip. Inaugural pike. Whoa! <laughs> You know, when it, when, you, uh, when it was that much power, I, I assumed it was a pike. You know, walleyes don't do that. <laughs> nice! Whoa. Oh, he cut it. No leader, right? No leader. Yeah. Woo! That was fun! <laughs> but that wasn't the end. In an ironic twist, Ben actually rehooked the same pike soon after and got his lure back. How's that for a story? Then it was time to run the rapids below the falls. Six yeah. And then we'll go to the right of the, the, the rock in the current. Yep. This is good. Yep. Don't you think you should go left? Right into the That's current? What I meant. Yeah. Right. We'll go here but then we'll have to cut it left to yep. avoid the, that rock in there. Yep. Yep. All the way right. And oh, then we got a ledge up there. Go uh, left. Yep. And then we'll go uh, river left. After this, after we go just, uh, we'll turn right again. Actually. Yep. At the end of the rapids, we noted a beach campsite we missed out on if it continued the previous day. Further on, we also found the sign to the portage around the dam. We may have missed both, but we appreciated camping at the dam, as well as seeing the falls and running the rapids below it. Nonetheless, we recommend future paddlers take the portage. The next section of white water was Domtar Rapids which was no more than a swift under what was once a logging road bridge. However, the next rapid wasn't a pushover. We are now just at Baptisimon, Baptisimon Rapids. There is a portage, there's a sign there, but we just pulled up because we want to see if it's runnable. On the map it says it's a chute. But shoots are runnable too. Oh yeah. Yeah? It's what? It's it's yeah? Yeah. Alright, sounds exciting. Oh. Okay. Fun. Here's what Baptist Simon shoot looks like. The last drop is the crux of the rapid due to the mess of currents and standing waves. So we're going to attempt it, but it is big, strong and powerful. There is a little bit of a V there, but that's the main 
tongue that we need to get out of. If we fall in there, definitely gonna Game dump. Over. If we hit here, we might make it, but it'll, it's like a wall. It'll just hold us back, and it may turn us over into the tongue and dump us there as well too. So there's a good chance of dumping. The only good thing is that if we do dump, it's pretty safe. There's like, it's just flat water here. In fact, it's gonna be trickier at the top because we're gonna get, get off the main uh, channel there, eddy into there, this calm spot, come down this drop, and then aim down for this V. I don't, how confident are you feeling? <laughs> Very confident. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're gonna run Baptiste Simon shoot. So it's gonna be a pretty big run here and with good chances of dumping. So it's nerve wracking, but exciting at the same time. Engage. Engage power. Eddie should be easy to get. Yep. You gotta go forward because I'm getting pushed by this. Okay, now it's switch. Turn. There we go. There we go. Okay. It's the current yeah, that's pushing me. There we go. Okay, here we go. Man, this back eddy. There we go. Ready? Yep. Okay. That was a rock. Woo. We got luck. Yeah. Because when we went sideways, it just filled. <laughs> oh, that is heavy. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Here's a different view in slow motion. Even though it looks like we hit the line, we were too far to the right and slid off the tongue and hit the wall of water as well as the rock underneath it. We took in a lot of water, but thankfully we managed to keep control of the canoe and get to shore. So there's a campsite here at the end of Baptist Simon Rapid and we're surprised to find People camped here. Now they're not here, um, but we we're also going to have lunch here. But uh, just because they've occupied the site, we're going to continue on to S Rapids. There's another campsite there, so we'll probably stop there for lunch. So we are at S Rapids. There's uh, multiple sets, but here's one that's a good drop. Definitely one that we're going to probably get a soaker, but uh, it's pretty straightforward. You want to be more to the right? Yep. Okay, get here. Oh, true. <laughs> okay, go, 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 go! S Rapids, as the name implies, is a long set in the shape of the letter S. There is a portage on River Right, but like most rapids, we opted to check it out and run what we could, and figure a way around the rest. The first several sets were easily runnable, but we soon came to bigger drops that had us pulling out. Okay. Yep. 
That dude sounds bigger down there. Yeah. Did you take the eddy on the left? Yep. River, see what's going on. Yeah. We can't tell from here. Yeah. Huh. So we front ferry and go in the middle there? Yep. Beyond the big rock, right? Yeah. Like okay. above it? Or are you like talking about below it? Below it? Below it? Okay. Think? Yeah, there's an eddy in there. Yeah. I think it's a good drop. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think it's a big one. As expected, the drop was too big to run. So we decided to scout the rest of the rapids as we could clearly hear bigger water ahead. Our scouting run revealed two major drops with powerful current, recirculating holes, and angry water. Neither could be run, but we figured out a way to get around it all with some elbow grease, confidence in paddling skills, and must-do maneuvers. This would be our most risky run yet. There was some hesitation and doubts, but further discussion and scouting determined it was feasible. The only problem being, a mistake would have consequences. We simply could not mess this up. Okay, so we're gonna do a series of liftovers and must do maneuvers so I can get a little dicey. So what we're gonna do is paddle, drag down over the other side, get to here, lift over there, paddle this section, drop down here, get into that small little channel and sneak in right in there. We're gonna tuck the boat in there do a lift over and then run the last part over there. But uh, this part is crucial. If you miss that, you're going down that big uh, chute falls. We're confident we can do it, but nonetheless, it's still nerve wracking. It's always uh, a little worrisome when you're doing something that has high risk. Anyhow, we're just gonna walk over back to the canoes and uh, go for it. We had a plan and now we simply had to execute it. The first part involved lining the canoe down the drop and setting it up for the first run. The next step was to run a rocky ledge and get into an eddy before the first big drop. However, the run took in too much water and it decided to pull off and bail. Any significant water in the canoe can create an undesirable wobble, especially when executing a quick turn. So I decided to call it since our next move was a must do. This was our first must do maneuver as we would be close to the top of the first drop. We simply had to spin the canoe into the eddy and get out before getting pulled into the main current. Yeah. We'll be fine. Go right down there, perfect. There we go. Yep. Perfect. 
Smooth. Next, we had to haul our gear and canoe up and over a ridge of granite. This would get us past the first falls and then set us up for our next move. Okay, here we go. Must do. After loading up, we got back in the water for our second must-do maneuver. Yep. Like the first, we had to get into an eddy at the top of a falls. Except this eddy was much smaller and the current stronger, yep. as it forced itself into a narrow before spilling yep. over the edge. At times like these, you have to be stoic and sure of yourself, but it doesn't mean you weren't nervous. Yep. This sneak channel wasn't part of the okay. original plan, but Ben preferred this route as it further slowed us down okay. in preparation for the eddy turn. Next one, yep. We made it. What a relief. The stressful part was now over. All that remained was one last lift over, then run yeah. the big outwash of S Rapids. Yeah. Right? A little precarious move. Yep. Okay? Okay, ready? Yeah, I got it. Yep. Doesn't matter. Well, it's big, right? So, you want to just run it down the right side? Yeah. Yep. We found out that these two men were from the campsite at Baptist Simon Chute. We planned to have lunch at S Rapids, but were asked to leave since they claimed this was their fishing spot. We were a bit shocked and puzzled by the comment, but we left and stopped further on down the river. It got even more weird. Despite being quite a distance away, one of the two men kept standing at the shore glaring at us. At this point we were not going to move, even if he paddled over to us, but the best part Ben found the honey hole where he hauled out several large walleye. Now that was pure karma. We continued on after our very late lunch and put in more distance. It was also very late in the day and we were having trouble finding a decent campsite when we came upon Hayward Rapid. So we're just at Hayward Rapid. Hopefully this is the last one before we find camp. Uh, but it is a good uh, good tongue. We're gonna avoid this This wave that curls can easily uh, take a canoe and kind of push it over to the side And then you get swamped up over in that big wave So we're gonna do a sneak loop probably come from that side and power through on the right side It's just uh, late in the day. And we don't want to get soaked Otherwise this one we would have just ran right in the middle and had fun with it Oh, you're going too far to the right. It wasn't exactly how I wanted to run the line, but it still worked out perfectly. Now our attention turned back to finding a campsite. It was almost 8 before we found a suitable place to camp. It took some time to hack out a spot but we made it work. In the dark, we thoroughly enjoyed a hearty walleye supper before we finally turned in. 
Even with the dam, the white was still living up as a river to be paddled. We definitely slept in and got to a slow start due to the late night, but we eventually got back on the river looking forward to what lay ahead. We had more rapids to contend with, but our biggest challenge today would be the 2.3 kilometer portage around Umbado Falls. But first, this. Stash. Okay, we're just approaching Stash Rapid. And it sounds like there is a big drop so we're gonna pull over. There's actually a portage sign on the right and we're gonna pull in there and uh, we'll scout it or either portage it. Oh yeah. Okay, after scouting, we decided that it's a safe enough run. I mean, there is a chance of dumping if you fill in, but there's a nice centered tongue and uh, really there's nothing after and we can swim to a beach where the the put-in is so there's really no danger if we dump but because of the power and the, and the size of the wave we could fill in but we're definitely going to go for it 70 percent chance to dump <laughs> i said 50 50. oh well let's give it a go Are you still at 50%? I still am. Okay. Okay, maybe 60. <laughs> okay. All right, we're doing it. Great, dude. Yep. Okay, not too fast. Dude. Yep. Oh, oh, I think we have to go oh, fast. Dude. That was a lot of fun, but how about another angle? There's nothing quite like running a fun rapid to start the day, and Stash Rapid certainly delivered. We also had high hopes for Oil Slick Rapid, the next one, but it was just meh. But it's what came next that got us curious. So we're just coming upon a sign that's warning us uh, that there's a portage coming up and I guess they want to make sure that people don't miss it because Ambata Falls will certainly be a disaster if you go down it by mistake. It was clear they didn't want you to miss it as there were multiple signs. Orange balls. And there's lots more signs coming up. I have never seen so many <laughs> They mean business. There's another one right there. And there's a few more over there. I don't. All right, here's a portage. Mbada Falls Portage. Not only were there multiple signs, they actually had colored balls strung up across the river. You simply couldn't miss it. Either way, no canoe would be able to get through takeout rapids, so portage it was. Okay, we are, it's about quarter to two and we're starting the Mbada Falls. We're leaving the canoe in one barrel. And as you can see, it's an ATV trail. We heard it was uh, a pretty good trail, nice and wide. And you can already see a sign here. It should be hot and sweaty. We just uh, soaked ourselves with DEET because of mosquitoes, but uh, Let's see how this goes. Okay. <laughs> We've already made a mistake. We took the wrong barrel. The barrel that we were supposed to take has the water in it, but it also had all the snacks, which we would have rehydrated at the end of the portage. And we had a water waiting for us here. Of course, we took the barrel that didn't have anything. So we are headed back to get it. 
Now we're officially on a logging road. We're about just over, maybe a little over one, over one kilometer in. Okay, so Mbada Falls is in that gorge there, of course. Couldn't see it, and there's the installation where they're generating power. And they built this, uh, sorry, this bridge here for, I don't know, I guess servicing, yeah, it's to service the lines here, power lines here. But you can see the rapids, the final drop at Sambada Falls. Wow, beautiful. Crazy butterflies here, I don't know. They're all over the road in certain sections. Hot. That is a welcome sight. Hey? Oh yeah. You can use that. Just seemed like it went forever. All clouding over. Oh, thankfully we're done. You can bet we were glad to finish the portage. We took time to cool down and relax, as well as snack and rehydrate beside the river. And because we were ahead of schedule and wanted to see Ambato Falls, we also decided to stay and camp here for the night. So apparently there is a trail to see the falls and it looked like it started like a trail but quickly looked like it wasn't but it says it goes by the water so we're not really sure if this is the right way but it apparently goes by the water it goes by the station and it continues on over to the falls so we'll keep going and see if uh, we can find it the trail indeed was rough and overgrown rarely if used we got spun around a few times but eventually found our way to the power station interestingly we found some displays that provide information on the Mbada Falls dam and like the dams we encountered earlier on the river this also was a partnership except this one between the Ojibwe of Pick River First Nation and a utility company. We continued on past the power station and made our way back into the forest. This part of the trail was different. It was still overgrown, but it was easy to follow as we could clearly see the well-worn path. This was likely the original portage that skirted Ambata Falls before they created the much longer 2.3 kilometer trail. So we definitely passed the falls. We didn't see any sign indicating where the viewing platform is, as you can see, falls is right there. Just goes over the edge. We're pretty we'll, we'll sure. Go and check it. Yeah, we're pretty sure that was an old portage. It makes sense. We would paddle up to here and then portage right past the falls and down. Now that we were here, we decided to look around before heading back. This hydroelectric installation is different from the previous two we encountered. This is a run of the river power plant, which is supposed to be less harmful to the environment, primarily because it doesn't have a large head pond and dam. Instead, it uses a weir to create a much smaller head pond, which in turn allows water to be fed into a diversionary channel. This eventually makes its way further down the river into the power plant. Nonetheless, it is obvious that both these power plants irreversibly impacts and changes the landscape forever. On our way back, we searched anything that looked like a side trail. Many led to dead ends, but we finally managed to find the correct one. Despite the difficulty, we're glad we took the extra time to locate it. It's a little difficult to find, but we finally found it. There's no sign to tell you to turn off of it. But uh, here's the viewing platform, and Ben's already, whoa, whoo, look at that. 
What a beauty. Incredible. You can see Ambato Falls is fairly small. Factors likely due to the season, but also undeniably due to the dam. Just how much we weren't sure, but we had seen pictures of it when it was substantially bigger. Nonetheless, it was still incredible to witness and experience. We were just thankful we made the effort to see it, as it was totally worth it. It was a long day in terms of walking, but it was rewarding, not only to see Ambato Falls, but to also put the long portage behind us. We enjoyed a savory noodle dish for supper with walleye fillets in the broth and then capped the night with a campfire before finally turning in. We woke up to a cool morning, sprinkling rain and wind. Not conditions most would prefer to be paddling a canoe. However, there was one prospect more than anything else that concerned us. Good morning, Ben. Hi. What's, what's your prospect for our second last day? Cold and probably wet. <laughs> and what do you think Lake Superior is going to look like? <laughs> breezy. <laughs> Very breezy. Today, we would end our paddle on the White River as it exits into Lake Superior, which was our biggest concern due to the current conditions. But with more rapids, falls, and a canyon to deal with, we focused on the tasks at hand and would deal with Lake Superior when we got there. Before we began the day, we had a couple things to do. First, sign the guest book at Hydro Rapids. This was done on the bridge by many hundreds of paddlers. Bill Mason? Hmm. Not sure about that one. And secondly, then run Hydro Rapids. Okay, another late departure, but just didn't want to get up when it was gray, cold, and rainy and windy. But uh, we're just at the top of Hydro Rapids and uh, we're gonna run it. Here we go. Okay. With that taken care of, we continued paddling down the White River and soon came to the park boundary where we would now be paddling through Pukasa National Park. It wasn't long before we came upon the first set of Twin Rapids. We paddled past the portage to see if we could run it, but decided against it due to the risk and the bigger set below it, so we headed back. It's an interesting put in, just uh, scrambling on rocks over logs to our put in but uh you can see there's another big drop over there that's a second set of twin rapids it's really probably not of rapids just small falls after the carry we decided to check out the rapids we bypassed they were huge and worth going to see these were the final two sets in this series of three Then there was a short paddle to the next portage, which definitely had to be carried around. Except this portage had a little surprise for us at the end. I just narrowly avoided getting stung by white jackets. There was this log that is at the base of the drop and you literally have to put your hand on it. Um, but on our way back, Ben went first and he must have knocked it. And he heard buzzing, but he didn't know what it was. And then when I came, 
I saw the nest and like dozens of white jackets all out of the nest and then they started coming at me and luckily my hat saved me a few bounced off my hat and I ran away so problem is we can't go that way on our way down because for sure with the canoe you will hit that log so we're gonna find another way to get the canoe down so we can avoid getting stung before tackling the last carry we checked out the second set of twin rapids and like the first definitely not runnable but certainly beautiful in the short canyon-like stretch of the river Then it was time to get the canoe and the rest of the gear to the put-in. We ended up bushwhacking off the trail near the end and sliding the canoe down a rocky drop-off. This was definitely more work, but preferable than getting stung. We had a bit of a paddle before we came upon our next obstacle, but the continual wind had us constantly thinking about Lake Superior and what conditions we'd find out there. Here, come and get me. Next, we came upon Hook Falls. The only problem was there was no portage. No sign, no trail, no nothing. So we pulled up cautiously near the brink and portaged alongside it. Being a part of the park, I was surprised there was nothing here. With the current water levels, we managed okay, but I could only imagine what it would be like coming upon this in high water. Before tackling more rapids, falls, and the biggest canyon of the trip, we fueled up with our favorite wraps for lunch before setting off again. Based on the map, there should have been a set of rapids with a 220 meter portage on river left, but surprisingly there was nothing at all. Although what was evident was that the shoreline was abruptly rising up on either side and we could hear the roar of big water ahead. We suspected this was the falls that was marked past the missing rapids, but we weren't totally certain, so we approached carefully. <laughs> yeah, this is no rapid, this is a very big fall. You can see it just drops over the edge. Yeah, we're definitely heading over to the portage, right over that way. So we pulled out before portage and we wanted to check it out because it just seems like it's such a significant drop. It's worth seeing. You can just hear it thundering down. It's not just a rapid. Now witnessing this massive cataract combined with the portage sign, it was irrefutable what this was and that the rapids simply did not exist. This is not a mistake any canoeist would want to make. No doubt we portaged around this, which even included a set of stairs. But at the Puddin, we couldn't resist seeing the falls from the downstream side and walked along shore to try and get a better view. The scene was incredible, but some of it was still blocked by vegetation. So we decided to get in the canoe and paddle up river to get a better angle. It was definitely worth it. Probably one of the best display of the White River with the massive falls next to the sheer granite wall. It was stunning. We were truly coming to understand why this river was so acclaimed. But there was more. We soon came to our next portage, the last one of the trip, 
which would take us around another waterfall in a deep canyon lined by hundred foot granite walls. Here, the river would take its last tumble as a white narrowed and toppled down Shigami Winnegan Falls through an incredible gorge. No doubt it was another highlight of the trip, an experience that truly brings to light why this river is worth canoeing. But like all good things, they unfortunately have to come to an end. And the end came with a tough 700 meter carry around the canyon that winded us. But we made sure to sign the real guest book before completing the final portage of the trip. But considering what we got to see and experience, it was definitely worth it. And Ben just finished the last portage of the trip. Nice job. Oh. In the pain cave, eh? <laughs> nice job. We made it, buddy. Whew. All that was now left was a four kilometer paddle to Lake Superior, where the white would finally end its journey. We were still nervous as to what kind of conditions we'd find at the end. But before we concluded our time on the White River, she had one last surprise for us. Something. We thought it was a snag. No. Oh yeah? Ben decided to troll along the final stretch of the river when he hooked onto something. Initially he thought he got a snag as he couldn't reel it in. It didn't help that the wind was howling and the canoe was being tossed around. But then things got crazy. Whatever was on the other end decided to run the line as a rod bent over and the spool screamed in protest. It didn't help that Ben was using my lightweight rod and reel, so he did his best to minimize the drag and carefully work the fish, but it wasn't easy. We knew at any moment the line could break. As Ben worked the fish, I did my best to control the canoe on my own, as we were being pushed backwards by the wind driving down this deep, narrow valley. We had a few close calls when the fish almost ran all of the line off the spool, but Ben carefully managed to work it back every time. It was nerve-wracking and exciting at the same time, and we were dying to see what was at the end of the line. Then, we finally got a few glimpses of it. It was a pike, a very thick pike at just over two feet long. It was a powerful brute that just wouldn't give up and often dragged our canoe at the same time. We discussed our limited options as there was neither a suitable place to land the canoe nor did we have a net. Due to the challenging circumstances, we decided to just pull the lure out of the mouth with a forcep when it tired enough. But in the end, it did it for us. As we were trying to position the fish by the canoe, it gave another violent thrash and finally freed itself of the lure and slowly made its way to freedom. We would have loved to let this bite go under a different scenario, but it wasn't meant to be. Nonetheless, what a rush and what an incredible way to remember our final moments on the White River. So, this is our first glimpse of Lake Superior. It's right at the end of my paddle and handle, right there. Right now we still got a he uh, tailwind. So right in this little junction here is supposed to be a campsite and a little portage to the other side of Lake Superior. So, um, it's for people who are trying to get out to Lake Superior and if it's too, like the water is too crazy with waves and, and, uh, and the current, then they can easily portage out to Lake Superior this way. So we're going to check it out just to see what the conditions of Lake Superior is. If it's really bad, then we'll probably try to stay here at this campsite. Unexpectedly and thankfully, we found Lake Superior to be in almost the ideal conditions to paddle. 
With all the wind we experienced throughout the day, this was nothing like how we thought this large freshwater ocean to be like. So we got back in the canoe and paddled the final kilometer of the White River to its mouth. Well, it is calm. Yeah. We can do it. We I made it. So warm. Yeah, still. Till it hits Lake Superior. Not long after, it was official. We're finally in the inland sea. Woo! Oh, it's getting cold. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we got the swells now. Yeah. Oh, okay, now it's freaking cold. <laughs> That's all it took. Oh, yeah. Here's that swell. Very typical of Lake Superior. After eight days, dropping 765 feet over 192 kilometers, we paddled, portaged, and dragged the entire length of the White River from Lake Naguazu to Lake Superior. We finally made it. After all the unexpected setbacks, surprises, and challenges along the way, we couldn't be happier as we paddled the final strokes of this incredible forgotten river into the inland sea. Even though our time on the White River ended, our journey wasn't over just yet. Ben and I have paddled many stretches of this inland sea and are quite familiar with Lake Superior's temperament, so we still couldn't let our guard down. We were thankful the conditions were okay for us to continue on from the mouth so we ended the long day in Picture Harbor for our last night. But it's a beautiful night on Superior and we got some good news. We uh, found out, <clears throat> we got the weather report from uh, Ben's wife and the, actually the waves are going to be less uh, than today and the waves weren't too bad today, so it means that tomorrow we should be able to get out without any incident. We were relieved to get good news regarding the weather and water conditions for the next day, so we were able to relax and enjoy the Last Supper while chatting and reminiscing about the trip. We slept soundly that night knowing we'd be able to paddle the final stretch to Hattie Cove without issue. Even still, I woke early, listening intently to the wind and waves. If you've ever paddled Lake Superior, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You never ever really let your guard down. The day started a bit overcast and cloudy, but it soon gave way to another beautiful day. Then we continued with the same routine we've been following for the last nine days, having breakfast and then packing up. But today, it would be the last. All that remained was five more kilometers of paddling. We still had a long open water crossing around Plater Harbor but the conditions were generally as forecasted and despite some bigger waves and chop, it wasn't a problem. We enjoyed the final paddle on Lake Superior like we often do when it is calm, as the clear green-hued waters contrast with the barren rocky shore. Then we made the final turn into Hattie Cove, where we could see the visitor center across the water, and now knew for certain that we not only made it back safe, but the trip would officially be coming to an end. It's always mixed feelings when I end a canoe trip. I miss my wife and our pups at home, but I long to continue paddling, seeking and exploring waterways well known and forgotten. Ironically, the White River was both, a river popular and well known in the paddling community years ago, but forgotten for over a decade due to the construction of the dams. Is the White River still worth paddling? My answer is yes, but it has mixed feelings too. Many of us long to escape the urban life and we often do that by heading to places that are still wild. The White River unfortunately isn't as wild as it once was. No doubt you will come across clear evidences of that. But in large parts, not only does it remain wild, 
but the essence of the river still remains. Whitewater, wildlife, canyons, and impressive waterfalls will continue to awe and remind you why this river was highly acclaimed. But now you know, and it is your decision to make. The White River has a story, a story only as good as the one you let it tell you.